Okay, uh, welcome to the lecture on green high performance computing. So before I start with that, uh, I need to say that I've shamelessly stolen the slides from the staff scientist in my group, Alexei Kozlov, who is also the main developer of um, the new version of RaxML, RaxMLMG, and works in my group in Heidelberg. Okay, so here's a picture of Alexei. And while the introduction is fairly simple, we all know about climate change and um, that it is important to take action and it's also urgent. So we need to do something about it. Um, if you look at the personal carbon footprint of Alexei, in terms of mobility, he uses a bike, he's um, taking care or taking, well, paying attention to what kind of food he's buying, he's not doing some any extensive shopping, so that's fine. Um, so if you look at the axis of evil uh, with uh, respect to climate impact, um, we have uh, Holy Greta here, then we have a biker, car, <laughs> shell, Volkswagen, and then the source of all evil over here. So I would say that our group computational molecular evolution group is somewhere located here. So um, we're doing pretty well. But what about all the computations that we are responsible for? Um, <clears throat> so if we look at the carbon footprint of computing and what we're doing here, we will um, look at the cluster that is called Haswell and that is located at our institute and um, look at the power or energy requirements of the CPUs that are installed there, right? So there are two CPUs times uh, 85 watts, plus the peripherals, disks, um, communication infrastructure, etc., plus cooling. So this is about 200 watts. Um, so if we run a single node job for 24 hours, we, which is not like a large job, right? Um, on a single node, we already have consumed 4.8 kilowatt hours. So um, the German energy mix for 2019 was that um, around 400 grams of CO2 are produced per kilowatt hour. So the CO2 um, emissions of this compute job are 4.8 kilowatt hours times 0 0.4 kilos. So it's 1.92 kilos of CO2, which is actually qu quite large and um, corresponds to approximately <laughs> doing 10 kilometers in um, a car like this. Okay, so basically <clears throat> this puts us further to the right on this uh, axis of evil of, um, you know, of climate change. Um, so what are the ways to reduce carbon footprint? Well, one is uh, awareness, right? So we should avoid unnecessary computations, but um, it's not really, um, it's not really easy. So for instance, in this slurm system um, that you use in many systems for submitting jobs, um, this energy monitoring um, that is available is really uh, very well hidden. So um, you really need to spend some time to figure out what the um, energy consumption of your jobs actually is. Okay, so <clears throat> there are some inherent limitations to reducing our carbon footprint. So one is just la laziness, uncertainty, etc. Um, now let's talk a little bit about innovation. So this is uh, Alexei added this trademark sign here. Um, so this is kind of, you know, just hoping on innovation and not really becoming active and trying to reduce the carbon footprint is a holy grail for politicians, but also for voters. So we can just compute, do business as usual and just wait for technological improvements. Um, so will there be any kind of disruptive technology coming soon? 
like a fusion reactor, quantum computers, etc., etc. And then, so those are the disruptive technologies, and then we have all slow evolutionary or incremental improvements uh, in terms of energy efficient hardware and software. So, um, and this is the typical, um, some typical quotes by politicians. Um, so um, Angela Merkel said that it was under, understated how technology innovation, especially in the energy sector, but also in energy saving, saving opened the possibilities to achieve the CO2 reduction goals. Here, this guy's from the Liberal Party in Germany, um, and it's about the statement uh, along the same lines, we must solve the climate problem with innovations, and let's trust the engineers, consumers, and scientists that they will find the most effective and economical way for resource conserving production and consumption. So, um, question is whether that is true or not. Um, so if we look at the um, green 500 list, so this is a list of the 500 most energy efficient uh, supercomputing systems in the world, we can see that we have uh, experienced an exponential growth of performance per watt, right? So energy efficiency has improved, but slowly. So those here on the x-axis are the years. And this... Um, on the y-axis are the uh, mega flops, so um, floating point operations, millions of floating points operations that can be conducted per watt, right? And so the red line here is the top system, so the most energy efficient system, and this, the blue line here, is the average overall 500 um, supercomputing, energy efficient supercomputing systems um, on this list. Right. So, uh, further thinking about innovations, well, one possible way to innovate, of course, is to design more efficient software if we think about the cost of computing. Right. So here, for instance, um, this is like typical publications of our lab. Um, here we implemented like a fast and memory efficient implementation of this transfer, of this new transfer bootstrap method. Um, and we got like a almost 500 fold speed up. We um, designed and released the new version of RaxML that is called RaxML and G, so next generation. That was up to four times faster than the old RaxML that I had designed. Then we have something, um, a tool here that is called evolutionary replacement algorithm um, that achieved like a, the new version. So this is also the next generation implementation of that. Um, that obtained like a 30-fold speed up over the old implementation. And then we have like another tool here um, for a single locus species delimitation under maximum likelihood. So molecular species delimitation under maximum likelihood and Markov chain Monte Carlo method that attained a 1,000-fold speed up. So you could say with those innovations, um, that with those innovations, our problem is solved. Um, so kind of we're even more <laughs> holy than Greta here with all those papers that we've published. Um, but why is this not true? So uh, here comes the Jamin's paradox. paradox. Um, you see different ways of uh, moving here and different ways of reducing garbage. But the key question here really is, well... Um, what happens if I improve the efficiency of something, right? So this was like for um, coal, burning a coal and the efficiency of, of uh, coal-based machines. Well, you have improved efficiency. This means lower cost. And that actually means uh, or induces an increased uh, consumption rate. So basically, if you think about it, like if we go back to the previous slide, um, the increased efficiency here just means that many, many more people will execute all those tools more frequently and on larger data sets because the scalability of the tools has also improved, right? So um, if you have a thing that is 1,000 times faster, you um, may want to just do a much more detailed 
analysis with more experiments, more data sets, more replicates. Um, here you will also, because it's so fast, just run it on a larger data set and not think about reducing the size of your input data set. Um, and the same holds for those two codes here. So basically, uh, especially since the scalability, the memory consumption are being reduced by so much, all of a sudden um, tools that previously were only run on like big servers or supercomputers are now also being run on laptops and lab servers around the world because they're so, so much more efficient and um, therefore it doesn't really uh, solve our problem. So um, improved efficiency uh, just means that, you know, uh, the tools like the software will be increasingly used or more frequently used. Okay, so basically this means here that we're not really doing any good to the world with the, um, with the uh, increases uh, efficiency improvements in our codes. So we're just making the problem worse. So now we're kind of, our group is located over here. If I haven't said that, CME stands for Computational Molecular Evolution. Okay, um, so nonetheless, technological process is still important for quality of life and scientific discovery. But the point we really want to make here is that it is inefficient with respect to climate change. Um, and so solutions that really work well, that's carbon-free energy and policy changes. Um, so here uh, is just an outline of the share of renewable electricity in Germany. Um, so around 50% is the 2019 estimate, then the plan for 2030 65%, and for 2050 is 100%. And here you can just um, see the fractions over of renewable energies uh, over time axis. Okay, now if we have a look at this, <clears throat> over time, so this is um, timeline for July, just given in hours, and this is the um, energy generation from renewable energies here. So then we have the same plot here for October. And so in July, you can see here that, of course, during daytime, um, solar energy peaks here, uh, whereas the peaks in <clears throat> from wind are a lot, like a little bit interspersed. Um, so often it's more windy uh, at night. But the key, of course, is that we have those like high peaks here from solar energy um, during noon. And of course, this is dramatically reduced in October with uh, uh, decreased um, sun intensity. But the, uh, what we can see here is that the, the, the wind, for instance, contributes more. So it tends to be more windy in October. Um, and so uh, this also means this uh, variability that we have um, variable CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour. So as you may expect, during this uh, peak time of day, where solar energy is contributing the most, we have like, uh, especially in very sunny days, we have like very low or lower emissions, CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour. Um, and the same holds true for October here, although the variation is some, somewhat a little bit smaller. Now, um, the interesting thing about this here is that if I overlay the um, price of a kilowatt hour with the CO2 generation of a kilowatt hour, there is like a pretty clear correlation here of those two curves, right? So this here are the CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour, and those are the actual prices. The blue line here are the actual prices per kilowatt hour. Um, <clears throat> right. So what we could do um, would be some sort of adaptive scheduling. So we could dynamically adjust the cluster energy our compute cluster, the cluster energy consumption um, to match this pattern. So if we have like a high price or um, CO2 emission, uh, we could just decrease the overall power consumption of our cluster. And while we have a low price, um, 
and this is correlated with low CO2 emissions, we could increase the power. Um, so there should could be some incentives for users like flexible billing or fair share factors, etc. Um, so now you hear the standard argument, well, you know, we're, we're doing such important research that our cluster is always full. And this is essentially exactly the problem, right? So um, would we be willing uh, to make a trade-off, like to um, decrease the throughput by 10% for substantial CO2 as well as cost savings? Um, so question is, well, is there a headroom for power increase? And this actually means that we need to, to conduct some quantitative assessment. <clears throat> So how could adaptive scheduling work? Like here are some approaches. So if you think about a compute cluster, we could just like uh, shut down some nodes during the high cost time, high emission time, and only schedule high priority jobs during this time. We could also kill jobs and restart them later on, but this of course uh, requires some additional software or machinery. So we need to uh, have jobs that can be checkpointed or we can suspend the current job to the, the main memory and then uh, continue it later on. So this is easy to implement, but relatively inflexible. Um, so here is another idea for adaptive scheduling that I think is more promising. So we can actually dynamically adjust the CPU frequency. So um, there's support in all modern CPUs for changing the CPU frequency. And of course, the higher the CPU frequency is, the more energy we consume. And this could be implemented at the job scheduler level, right? So at the software system that handles your job on the cluster. Um, so the big um, advantage is that there are no modifications required in the application code, such as checkpointing or the um, capability of interrupting the job. Um, so here uh, you can see, if we list CPU details, we can see that this is the base frequency of the CPU, 2.4 gigahertz. Um, this is the all core turbo frequency. So all cores um, located on the die can run at 2.6 gigahertz. And this is the max maximum turbo frequency on a single core when we're just using a single core that can go up to 3.2 gigahertz. So there is just, there's quite some, um, you know, tolerance or room for uh, playing around with uh, CPU frequency. Okay. Um, another uh, approach, if we think about adaptive scheduling is to just the number of cores and nodes for parallel codes. So we have this classical resources versus speed or rather time to completion trade-off. And so here, if we look at the execution time of some parallel code over the number of threads or number of cores used, typically, initially, like I have, if I go from one to two cores and then from to four cores, I have a pretty good reduction in execution time, so in time to solution. But then as I add more cores, uh, parallel efficiency doesn't really increase anymore. And even like if I have too many cores, meaning that, you know, I need to communicate very frequently and don't spend that much time computing, the um, <coughs> execution times actually increase again. So <coughs> we can see the analogous phenomenon here. So this is the number of threads. And here we just have the speed up. So how many times faster does my code get when I run it on two cores? So this is like it gets 1.9 times faster. When I run it on four codes, it gets three times faster. When I run it on six codes, it gets, well, 3.6 times faster, etc. And then I again have this decline. And so here, what is uh, really important uh, or what we're most interested in is the um, degree of parallel efficiency, right? So um, how far off am I from an optimal use of the system where all cores are doing useful computations and not waiting for communication and stuff like that? Uh, 100% of the time. So we see here in one core, evidently the parallel efficiency is 100% because this one core doesn't communicate with other cores. For two cores, it's around 95% <clears throat> and then it, for four cores, it drops below 
And so there are a lot of reasons for that that I'm uh, going to cover in the kind of standard high performance computing lecture. So <clears throat> there's Amdahl's law, we're going to talk about that. There is the communication overhead, load imbalance, so some cores may have to do more work than other cores, and also uh, issues pertaining to CPU frequency scaling. <clears throat> so a normal mode, um, a normal operation mode when the energy is not too um, expensive or to, uh, is not producing too much um, uh, CO2, you would probably choose to run your tool here, um, your analysis on four cores, have a threefold speed up, a threefold uh, increase in the time, a decrease in the time to solution and live with those 75% efficiency. But then <clears throat> in uh, low power mode, well, you could just use two cores, have uh, almost a twofold speed up and use this 95% um, efficiency, right? So if um, the power mm, is very expensive, so energy is expensive, you would go for um, the configuration that gives you the best efficiency but still so, or a balance between the best efficiency and a, a reduced time to solution compared to the running the job on a single core. And then if the energy is cheap, you could say, oh, well, maybe I should use six cores, get, uh, well, 3.6 fold speed up and live with those 60% of parallel efficiency. So um, industry is already on the way to carbon uh, neutral computing um, the question here is to uh, have all those uh, computing centers or cluster centers. The question is, well, what about academia? So academia is somehow really lagging behind in taking action about this. Um, so we don't see any power plants. So those are like, um, this is a computing center of the University of Heidelberg. This is the um, this one over here is the Munich supercomputing system, one of the top three systems in Germany. And here, this is the um, supercomputing center at Stuttgart, which is also among the top three uh, supercomputing centers in Germany. Okay, <clears throat> so now let's look at the um, at phylogenetic inference. So here. Um, on the y-axis, we have the power requirements in terms of watts. And um, on the um, x-axis, we have the CPU frequency. So what we can see here is that the CPU frequency correlates well with the power we need for racks and LNG. So basically here, what we did is that we just adapted or explicitly set the CPU frequency and measured the um, performance for DNA data and for uh, protein data. Um, so you can see that the curves are fairly similar. And so the yellow dots um, correspond to the power of the CPU plus the RAM. And then the, um, the, the lines over here show you the, the power that is consumed by the entire node where we're running our tool on. Okay, so now this is um, interesting. So this is like um, the energy for an entire run, right? So this means like we multiply the runtime with the power uh, consumed by the node here. And now here um, <clears throat> we see that um, increasing the CPU frequency um, does not really... Um, change anything with respect to the energy consumption anymore, right? So because the job may run faster, but um, on the other hand, it will consume much more energy. So there's kind of no, um, th there's no further improvement as you would expect here that, well, you know, if my job runs faster, even if I use a higher CPU frequency, um, uh, it will, consume less energy. So we find the sweet spot here that is around um, two uh, CPU clock frequency of two gigahertz. Okay. Um, and so the reason why we observe that um, is that, well, the, the um, phylogenetic likelihood calculations are what we call uh, memory bandwidth bound. So 
we spend a lot of time in accessing memory from RAM, so the conditional likelihood vectors, um, the sequences of the alignment, uh, as we're just going linearly through those vectors, doing like just a few computations per vector entry and then continuing along the vector. So, um, <clears throat> and actually this means here that, well, the, the CPU at this point is fast enough to match the memory access speed. And everything from here, from this point here to the right, means that the CPU is wasting cycles um, and by to wait, uh, waiting for the memory uh, to get the data into the CPU. Um, <clears throat> right, so this is like the key point that we want to make, that, that um, it really is very application dependent, but for instance, for phylogenetic inference, with modern, like a standard, very representative, modern CPU architecture, um, using anything more than two gigahertz in terms of clock frequency just doesn't make sense. So the question is what next? So one idea we have in mind is to um, develop a Raxam LNG eco option that would strive to save energy for phylogenetic inference runs. And um, one idea here is to, have, to use adaptive CPU frequency tuning and also maybe to take into account the live live CO2 emissions. So there are some uh, tools with inter appropriate interfaces that allow you for certain countries in the EU, in the EU to um, get data about the current CO2 emissions uh, per uh, kilowatt hour. Okay, so maybe finally, well, is renewable energy climate friendly? Um, so uh, here I just I'm showing you a table of global of the global warming potential of selected electricity sources. So this essentially so this essentially goes down to the uh, production, shipping, installation, etc. of renewable energies. So basically, the numbers here cover the full life of the source, the energy source, from material and fuel mining through construction to operation and waste management. So um, this is just to maybe uh, put aside the myth that, uh, for instance, um, solar energy, um, the production, the energy you need to use to produce solar panels is higher than the energy they will produce over the lifetime. Um, so this is essentially not true. And so this table here is uh, sorted by, by the median value. Okay, so that's it with that presentation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, if you have questions, you should probably mainly uh, send emails to Alexei, who is actively working on that.